Attorney General Ken Paxton, not guilty. After an historic two-week impeachment trial, the heavily Republican Texas Senate rejects 16 articles of impeachment in resounding fashion. Cleared of all charges, what's next for the Lone Star State's controversial top cop? In the nation's capital, the Democratic president under fire by House Republicans. Are impeachment proceedings a genuine search for the truth or a political ploy ahead of the next election? And here at home, Houston police announce a kinder, gentler pursuit policy. Will Chief Troy Finner's new plan let crooks off the hook or make our streets safer? I'm Greg Grugan, and welcome to Watch Your Point, where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, longtime Fox 26 legal analyst Chris Tritico. Next up, Houston attorney and conservative commentator Gary Polland. In the three spot, Charles Blaine, founder of Urban Reform. Batting cleanup, former Galveston mayor and Democratic candidate for attorney general Joe Jaworski. And closing us out, well-known businessman and columnist Bill King. Let's begin. We are proud of the case we put on. We should not have had to prove our innocence, but that's what we did. Do you all have any concern that this will have a chilling effect on future whistleblowers? Look, no. Uh, what, what, what I'm relieved about is it won't have a chilling effect on people that run for political office. This is a trial that should have never happened, period, full stop. Victorious Houston attorneys Tony Busby and Dan Cogdell minutes after securing across the board acquittal on 16 articles of impeachment aimed at their client, Attorney General Ken Paxton. Forewarned by Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick that this would be a political trial, what unfolded Saturday on the Senate uh, floor was clearly a partisan exercise with the Republican majority in the upper chamber voting not guilty. In the end, House product prosecutors got nowhere close to the 21 votes needed, managing at best 14. Afterward, in a speech clearly written well before the outcome was publicly known, Patrick tongue-lashed the Texas House. Millions of taxpayer dollars have been wasted on this impeachment. 31 senators and a large Senate staff that made this trial possible have put their family life, their jobs, their business on the hold for the last three months after already being here from January to June. I'm going to call next week for a full audit of all taxpayer money spent by the House from the beginning of their investigation in March to their final bills they get from their lawyers. Panel abuse of office, retaliation, obstruction of a federal investigation, and bribery. With their vote, the GOP Senate majority said it just didn't happen. All right, Chris Tritico, get us going here. Uh, did it live up to its billing, a political trial? Absolutely. I, mean, I, hate, I hate that I was right, but I, I've been saying all along this is a political process. And every impeachment in our lifetime has been nothing but politics. Um, and, and unfortunately, this lived up to its billing. Uh, at the end of the day, removal trials are nothing but politics. And, and that's what happened here. Uh, regardless of the facts, Regardless of whether or not Kim Paxton violated the law, the Republicans voted uh, their political party, except two of them, and, and left him in office. And right or wrong, that's the way politics works. They voted to keep him in office without regard to the, the, the law or the facts, period. And that's the way it works. Bill King, what's your take on this? Well, I agree that it's a political process, although there are some cases like Nixon, but it was not impeachment, but he would have been impeached by Republicans. I think the conduct has to be really bad and has to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Look, did they prove that Paxton was a really bad guy, that he's not somebody I'd want to hang out with, uh, that he's not an ethical person? He, he, they proved all that stuff. Did they prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed a crime, which is the standard the senators had in their mind? Now, I'm not sure about that, and the problem is this was always going to be a tough political vote for these senators. The House needed to come in and knock it out of the park, and I think they left, their presentation was disorganized, left too many open questions, and I think they tried to do too much in the short amount of time they had to work with. Joe Jaworski, uh, <clears throat> we definitively know because Tony Busby argued this. Uh, 
our top cop doesn't trust cops, doesn't trust the DPS, doesn't trust the FBI. Use that in closing arguments. Uh, do you think Texans heard that or should they hear that? Well, they should hear that, Greg, and it's kind of a shock to hear because the top cop, the Texas Attorney General, ought to be backing the blue every step of the way because they work together so often. You know, I, I have to say, um, I'm so disappointed uh, in our Senate, and I thought surely uh, after five days, six days, seven days of testimony with these conservative whistleblowers who had great personal integrity and took great risk in going forward and putting their careers on the line that people would hear that, people would sympathize with that. The closing arguments, even more so when you have electeds speaking to electeds, brothers and sisters join us in doing the right thing, the invocation of Sam Houston, the whole bit, and yet it seems like it was preordained. It was a political move with a trial embedded. All right, Gary Polland, um, you spend a lot of time in court. Uh, did the House make their case in totality? Uh, Short answer, no. They, there was a lack of focus. You know, you had all these articles of impeachment. Some of them were stronger than others. Some, I think, had <coughs> what, virtually no votes. Right. So what they should have done is focus like a laser on the best two or three. Then they would have had more time. I think the time limit also affected. But I think that the presentation by the House manager's lawyers was not focused. I did think the highlight for them was the final argument. Not done by the lawyers, but done by the legislators. And I thought Representative Leach was particularly compelling in his, who's a strong conservative uh, and a friend of Paxson's who said, you know, this conduct is just not acceptable. So now uh, we're left with what, what, what's the future and when is the other shoe going to drop? Because there's more shoes dropping on this, this gentleman. All right, credit where credit's due. Uh, Charles Blaine in our discussions predicted this outcome. Uh, why? Why? You know, I mean, when, so when I predicted this, I, I, well, so when we talked this, the week before this, I said I felt Paxson was more popular than he was in, during the primary. Then when we talked on Thursday after this trial, I looked at this and I, and I just did not see the House making their case. I was waiting for it. And I think the thing is, when you are, remove the emotion out of it from the closings and all this other stuff and the crying of the whistleblowers, and if you take all of that out of it and you look at what they presented, did they make those connections that they set out to make to make you believe that the countertops and the the you know the quid pro quo and all this stuff they were never able to actually prove that I, I, I you can infer things you can assume things you can think he's a bad person but they did not prove that and I think that's where they fell short they had a very high bar and they said the evidence was worse than we heard during the house um, trial and they did not deliver on that in the end Chris Tritico if you had to make a conspiracy case we had the Attorney General intervening in five different areas for one Texan, Nate Paul. I mean, there has to be a there there. Right. So I would have dropped some of the weaker counts before I started trial and focused on the ones that I could have proved. And, and it would have made it easier. With only 25 hours in, in, in all these counts, you can't, move, you can't put all that on. You got Tony Busby objected to every question and, did all, and that was intentional to delay the process and make you run out of time. So you drop some of the counts, you can focus on the ones you, you think you can win and, and put a tighter case on, like, like, like uh, what's your name? Gary said, <laughs> like Gary said, and focus that better. All right, you know, we're talking about making the case, but did it really matter? Was the thumb on the scale on this bill? And we just have 20 seconds. I, as I said earlier, I think that to have gotten the conviction, the House managers would have had to knock it out of the park and they didn't get it passed out of the infield. Okay. Still to come, House Republicans target President Joe Biden for potential impeachment connected to alleged influence peddling. And in our Sunday survey, we're asking viewers if they believe politicians at both the state and national level are abusing the impeachment process. Tell us what you think. Vote on our webpage, fox26houston.com. Just click on poll at the top of the page or tell 26 using our news app. But up next, we continue our discussion of the Paxton verdict. Was the acquittal based on lack of evidence or just pure politics? Politician in the state of Texas at this time. And the Republicans in the Texas Senate just returned him to the office of top cop. 
House Prosecutor Ann Johnson lashing out at what she clearly believes were <laughs> verdicts driven by greed for political power and counter to the best interest of 30 million Texans. As we Sunday morning quarterback this impeachment outcome, I have to return to late May when the House unveiled its secret investigation and slammed through the articles of impeachment within a few days time, drawing <clears throat> protests over the lack of due process. Question panel, did that expedient, so to speak, come back to haunt them, or would it really not have mattered given the political positioning that's unfolded here? I'm gonna ask you that, uh, Gary Pollan. I don't think it mattered. I really don't. I think uh, I, it was a political decision, as many as many of the panel have said, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> they weren't going to vote against Paxton. And also, don't forget the multi-million dollar lobbying campaign that was going on by strong conservative backers of Paxton. They were encouraging people to email their senators and call their senator's office. <coughs> they were on the web. Uh, I went online. I'm looking at something, and there's a thing that pops up. You know, write your senator and tell them not to convict Paxton. So there was organized. There wasn't a campaign that I saw on the other side. So that was part of the problem. But again, I want to mention one other thing. Uh, Tony said he was found not guilty. Yeah. And what that means is not proven. It doesn't mean he's mm -hmm. not guilty. Okay, Joe, there are those who would say, Dan Patrick had three million reasons to put his thumb on the scale. Uh, I guess this verdict doesn't, doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, I guess, rebut that. Well, Greg, now that the evidence is done and it's on the interweb, as we call it, for people who want to still look at it, like maybe the federal grand jury, we now turn to the process. How in God's name could you call this a fair trial when the presiding judge gets $3 million, $1 million straight out in a $2 million loan, and there is an epic masterpiece of jury intimidation called Defend Texas Liberty in San Jacinto 2023. That's not how you do a fair trial. All right, Bill, jump in here. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure it was ever going to be a fair trial <laughs> to start out with, but <clears throat> again, I get back to this is a political trial. And to get Republicans to impeach a Republican, you've got to prove it overwhelmingly. And the House just did not do that. They present a very poor case. But let me say this. The legal problems for Ken Paxson are far from over. There's a securities trial. The whistleblower case is going to be you know, revived now because they didn't get their $3 million. And we know the feds are looking at this very carefully. So don't think this is over. Okay, we're going to talk some more about this. Up next, the future ramifications of Ken Paxton's acquittal. Will the state's top cop use the Senate exoneration as a springboard to higher office? Welcome back. Release the Kraken, a movie line I find appropriate when it comes to the likely political fallout of this impeachment acquittal. Ken Paxton, already a highly favored son of the GOP hard right, now completely exonerated of what he's already referring to as sham charges from so-called rhinos, rhinos sorry, and their collaborators, the evil Democrats. One would guess Paxton, who touts his close ties to Donald Trump and has promoted his upcoming interview with Tucker Carlson, may well have set his sights on bigger jobs with more power, a pursuit that would draw plenty of support from the usual West Texas suspects. Panel, should Greg Abbott and even Dan Patrick be watching their backs? I'm going to ask you that, Chris Tritico. Well, certainly he, um, he's emboldened now, and uh, I, would, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's looking now at something higher. I, I, wouldn't, I don't see him running against Greg Abbott. Uh, Greg Abbott has got all the money he needs to stay right where he is as long as he wants. Uh, I would suspect if he's going to run for a higher office, it's going to be outside of, outside of um, a state office and run for maybe a uh, representative seat or maybe run against one of the senators who's going who's uh, not doing what he thinks he needs to be that needs to be done all right charles you agree with that uh yeah i mean i think that if he, he I, I would say probably senate or something um but i mean i think right now he's going to ride on the high of being the the you know attorney general back in charge and i'm going to be looking at fundraising numbers the from here on out because he was a national figure before but the the right has now definitely propped him up as even even more of a national figure obviously trump has come out in support there have been folks from all over the country who've been voicing their support from so i'm really curious to see this bounce back after this. All right, surprise, surprise. Our uh, viewers in the Sunday survey say uh, 
Politicians are abusing the impeachment process. 90% of them saying yes. What do you think of that, Joe Jaworski? Well, you know, it, it looks like that may be the trend uh, now that we have, obviously, Biden under impeachment watch, like a hurricane in the Gulf. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I don't know you could call abusing impeachment three times in over 100 years in Texas, but I guess my question is, what's next? Maybe they'll impeach Paxton again after the feds have something to say. All right, Bill, uh, you and I have spoken, and you said regardless of how this goes, uh, this is indicative of a civil war, so to speak, within the Republican Party? Absolutely. I mean, the, the UT poll that came out right before the Paxton trial started showed his support among Republicans in Texas falling from 81 percent to 43 percent in a six-month period. And I hear all these, I see all these Republicans online saying, we've got to get the rhinos out of the party. Well, you know, you get all those rhinos out of the party, there's not going to be a lot of people left in the Republican Party. So a friend of mine texted me last night and said, what do you think? I said, this is the beginning of the Civil War of the Texas Republican Party. Gary Pollan, jump in here. Yeah, well, I fought this battle when I was, became party chairman in 1996. <clears throat> and I ran as the strong conservative candidate. But uh, when I got in, I told the strong conservatives, I'm not move, we're moving people from the party. I agree with 80% of the time. So moderate Republicans, uh, pro-choice Republicans, they have a place in the party I'm running. I took a lot of crap for that. But I was right, and Bill's right. If the party divides between the conservatives and the more conservative conservatives, where I, by the way, I put myself there, but I'm also a realist, and the Democrats actually pull their head out from wherever it's been hidden. <laughs> they, uh, the Republicans are going to be in trouble in Texas. But if we, if they keep nominating, and I say this fairly, Rosemary Garza, alleged communist Democrat, and don't nominate someone like Joe Jaworski, who is a well-respected former mayor of Galveston for Attorney General, they're going to keep losing. All right. Charles Blaine, you're in the middle of this battle all the time. <laughs> True? True? Yes. What's going on here? I mean, are you fearful of a, a deep divide that continues to get deeper? Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, we, you know, I, I don't think the party right now knows how to come together. I think that everybody's out for blood and everybody's going to be out for blood. I agree with Bill, though. No matter which way this went, that was going to happen. I think this way, uh, I don't know if it makes it a little bit better because the, the folks who would have been more angry and more funded are now less angry because they, they you know, are still in power. But I, I, I do think that this is going to further div the, the divide. I don't think it gives Democrats an edge. I mean, I think they're still kind of, you know, far beyond winning statewide office here. But I do think it puts us in a vulnerable position moving forward. All right, Chris Tritico, yes or no question, and then you can respond. <laughs> uh, the Senate and Dan Patrick had the uh, choice of uh, sticking up for justice or sticking it to the House, and that's what they chose. Well, absolutely, they chose to stick it to the House and, and play politics on this, and that's the problem with, with these types of, uh, of, of procedures is is like I've been saying all along, politics rules the end of the day here. And um, I don't think that, uh, it, it, that we can say that Texas impeachment process has been abused, but it has been nationally, and this was an abuse in this one. All right, we're gonna leave it there. Strikers headed to the picket lines and demanding concessions from America's big three. What next for Ford, Chevy, and Chrysler as assembly lines grind to a halt? Historic. No, not the Paxton impeachment. We are moving to another major development, a strike declaration by the United Auto Workers Union. Under the category, go big or don't go at all, the UAW membership is walking out simultaneously on all three major American car makers. And that's where the historic moniker comes in because it simply never happened before which also means we have no idea what kind of impact the strike could have on an economy some believe is sliding into recession. Critics are blaming President Biden's near constant union boosting for fanning the flames of labor unrest. Panel first, they deprive us of snappy fresh riding on the tube, and now the ample supply of F-150s is in peril. <laughs> What's up with all this union muscle flexing, Charles? Yeah, um, you know, it's, <laughs> I think the, the unions, public sector and private sector, have had a stranglehold on us for a long time. And I say this as someone whose aunt is a UAW union organizer in Detroit, whose nephew is president of Amazon Labor Union. Um, and I think that when we look at public sector and private sector and the way they're holding hostage uh, taxpayers and stakeholders, we got to start to push back a little bit. They're saying that if, if UAW
UAW stays out for five days, it's going to cost the economy $10 billion. It's going to cost, I'm sorry, $5 billion. It's going to cost the state of Michigan, I think, $10.9 million in just tax revenue. And so this is a big issue that needs to be resolved, but I think we also need to start talking about how much influence unions have over our decisions. As the legal representative of four different unions, Chris Tritico, uh, <laughs> are you advising the automakers to just give in. Well, they haven't <laughs> called me. Uh, <laughs> I represent uh, four public sector teachers unions, so it's a little bit different uh, animal. But the the issue becomes um, in the automaker auto workers union uh, the the contract the collective bargaining contracts up, and the auto manufacturers uh, dug in and, and chose not to not to negotiate until the last minute, hoping that they could put the the auto, auto workers into a box and, and, and force them to negotiate from a position of weakness, uh, not, uh, not considering that their new president wouldn't do it. And uh, I think that, the, that, that looking at it from afar, they would probably yield on their demand of the 40% over four, over four years in exchange for a better pension. And the pension is the real problem here, I think, is, a, is the pension uh, aspect of this. Bill King, you've talked about pensions before. <laughs> no, so what's your take on this? Well, first of all, I want to point out, they struck all three companies, but only one plan at each of the three right. companies. So right. this is not going to have the economic impact of shutting down the entire auto uh, industry. Look, unions today, 11% of workers are a member of a union, 11%. So I disagree with Charles about they've got a stranglehold on us. Now in the public sector, there are some problems there. But polling shows that people are in favor of unions by 60 or 70 percent, which I think is quite interesting. And I think this is a result of the inflation we've been going through. When people see the purchasing power of their paycheck go down, they start hurting and so they want something done and what they want, they want to raise. All right, Joe, 30 seconds. Uh, you're a Democrat, and unions are a Democratic constituency. For good reason. I mean, this is where the working people have their voice. This is where American workers have their voice. After World War II, the unions were ascendant. It allowed people to have middle-class wages, buy homes, send their kids, you know, wherever they want to go in their future. But in the 70s, there were cuts made, and they pitched in, and they did their part to keep the economy going. This is now the, you know, the rooster coming home to roost. It's, Our, it's time for them to get, get a piece. I'm blocking out two minutes for Gary Pollan to rebut in overtime. <laughs> okay, up next, House Republicans on the warpath against President Joe Biden first demand and then receive an impeachment inquiry. Welcome back. Back to impeachment. Not the Lone Star State variety, but rather the kind we are more accustomed to in our nation's capital. I am directing our House committee to open a formal impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy announcing impeachment proceedings against our Democratic President Joe Biden, who is suspected of reaping illicit profits via his influence peddling son, Hunter. Never mind that we are just 13 months and change from an election, and never mind this impeachment effort has less than zero chance of being sustained in the Senate. The real questions are these. Should the House be working on improving the lives of Americans, or should they be investing their time in the same game of gotcha they were so furious about when it was aimed at former President Trump? I should note Hunter was reindicted this week on three felony gun charges, and the White House is saying the presidential son will not be pardoned if convicted. A lot there, Gary Polland. Yeah, uh, I think that the impeachment inquiry is more about uh, the state of the Republican caucus in the House, the fact that the Republican majority, I think maybe down to two votes, because we, we had retirements, we had, had special elections, and uh, there's a strong conservative faction that's been on McCarthy since the beginning. I, I personally think that under the, with, with a two-vote margin, I think he's doing a good job. It's tough. And uh, the Democrats, of course, control the Senate. So... A little bit of a distraction. I know that those who have said the inquiry should go forward will give us more tools to look at Biden, but there's no question in my mind that the Biden family has sold influence and basically sold our foreign policy, which is more outrageous than anything they accused Trump of. All right, Bill King, I can't deny you a chance to opine on dysfunction junction <laughs> at Congress. <laughs> Well, I think this is a sop to the Freedom Caucus to kind of get them off his back and see if he can get back to more important things. But look, 
this is just so endemic of the broken two-party system that we have. All they care about is fighting with each other. Neither one of them give a damn about the American people. It's about them holding on to power. It's about them satisfying their base, which is the folks that show up in the primary votes. That's all they care about. They do not care about solving immigration, inflation, immigrant, any of these big problems we have. All right, Charles Blaine. I mean, you know, we've all volunteered to make you the linchpin of a new pragmatic party, <laughs> you know, because, you know, you, you are the type of person who are, who's looking for solutions. It doesn't That's look right. like either party's looking for solutions. They're looking to perpetuate their own power. Well, of course, yes, because once they get there, that's all they worry about, it's power. And it's interesting, because <laughs> you look at the Capitol and you look at the legislature, it's, uh, once they get there, it's just worried about being a member and staying a member, and you gotta stay in the club. Um, but to, to this Hunter Biden stuff, it is really interesting, because did he do wrong? Yes. Should he get in trouble? Yes. But of all the charges that could be brought against him, this is it, this seems like some, one of the most unserious ones. I mean, not the tax evasion charges, not the failing to register as a foreign agent, the one charge that does not involve his father, and and uh, mind you, the tax evasion charge has a six year statute of limitations, and that's starting to run out mm -hmm. as well. So we're focused on this gun charge while everything else just sits over here. Hunter Biden, you know, Biden's son is everything that the left wanted Trump's kids to be, and they failed to call him out for it. Mm -hmm. All right. As a highly respected mediator, Joe Jaworski, how would you mediate uh, the, the factions in Congress? Oh, my goodness. You know, I wonder if it's capable of being mediated, but certainly there are, you know, better angels in Congress right now. So somebody within the body needs to step up for both parties and, and, and become sort of a, a favored caucus, if you will. So I would certainly look to who the representatives would be on some sort of mediation. Right now it can't be Kevin McCarthy, Matt Gates. you know, it can't be the squad. It would need to be people that actually can, you know, get a majority of the, of the Congress. People who are lame duck? Or they are, are going to be personally lame duck. I mean, you know, we've seen uh, John Cornyn try to reach across the aisle, and, and he got crickets. Slapped. You know, so Chris, jump in here. Well, <laughs> the, the this thing about the impeachment was Kevin McCarthy gave up his soul to get the uh, to get the speakership, and allowed uh, the, uh, any member to call for him to be voted out of speakership. And Matt Gates said, if you don't if you don't do this, uh, I'm going to call for the vote. And, um, and he had to do it, and this is where we are. Uh, with respect to Hunter Biden's indictment, they indicted him on a uh, charge that the Fifth Circuit just ruled unconstitutional. Uh, and so That's we'll see what happens uh, with this. I don't know where it's gonna go. The, the, the law's already been held unconstitutional. Bill King, back to the issue of a third party. Is one <coughs> viable? Yeah. Look, there is a huge vacuum in the middle of the political spectrum right now. We're down to about 22 or 23 percent of Americans identify as Republicans and about 25, 26 identify as Democrats. <coughs> so half the country refuses to identify with either one of these political parties. There's this huge sucking sound in the middle. Nature abhors a vacuum. Something's going to happen, but the two parties have rigged the ballot access system so it becomes very difficult and very expensive to do it. So at some point in time, moderates are going to have to get together and say we've had enough of this. All right, okay, we're going to talk about more of this stuff in overtime. Still to come, a major move to cut the number of police pursuits in Houston. Will the effort to limit crashes allow too many criminals an easy escape? But up next, more limbo for so-called dreamers as yet another court ruling reignites the threat of deportation. Over the past decade, a majority of Americans have come to believe that children brought to this country by their parents illegally should, in most cases, have the opportunity to remain in the only country many have ever known, provided they are law-abiding and productive. But as we've come to know what the majority wants, the majority doesn't always get. And so rather than codify DACA, Congress chooses to defer to a running legal gun battle that's triggered yet another adverse federal court ruling against the Obama era regulation. And so panel, the young and not so young people collectively known as dreamers, well, they are once again in immigration limbo. And with that, I go to you, Joe Jaworski. What do you make of this? How would you mediate this? Yeah, no, they, look, these uh, DACA uh, children and adults, as we know them, are some of the best 
of American ideals and values. Um, they're contributing, they're playing on sports teams, and they're you know, studying, uh, they're getting graduate degrees, they're working all throughout our economy. Uh, remove them, uh, which, you know, how would you ever do that? And you will lose a huge part of our economy and our cultural fiber. And so, to me, this is one where I would, as president, were I ever to get there, uh, would demand that this be sort of a priority. So, so, you know, I would mediate this by saying, can we not come together and support Americans in America? Because that's, that's who they are. Okay, my fallback position always is, what's fair and what's right? And, you know, it just doesn't seem fair or right to send a kid back to a country he's never known because his parents made a decision. Gary, uh, you know, I know you've thought about this. Yeah. Is there any, any solution here? Here's the problem. What's, what's not fair and not right is we have open borders. What's fair and not right is we're letting criminals and terrorists into this country, and the Obama administration and the Biden administration could care less. That's what's not fair. So from my standpoint, I think what the Congress should be doing is having a coming together, first to agree we're going to close the border and control the border. Second, let's figure out who the hell's in this country. And third, after we've done all that, run all the DACA kids, now adults, through the system and make sure they're not going to be on welfare, make sure that they're not criminals, and then let them stay. That's fine. But we have no clue who's here. We have, what, 9 million people come in since Biden's been president? We have no clue who's here. We have no idea. They hand them a piece of paper and say, show up in a year for your hearing on asylum, which we know 85 for 90 percent of them are rejected. But do they ever get kicked out of the country? No. Chris, what's your take on this? Well, I, 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 I'm trying to have trouble following that one, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. The, I love you, <laughs> <laughs> The... Um, Look, the DACA kids, if we're going to just talk about the DACA kids, that, that should have been solved years ago. They, they didn't do anything wrong. Uh, uh, the President Obama limited it just to the kids who, who were brought here by their parents as children. And now they're, they're having kids of their own. And Congress ought to sit down and fix that problem. And just, just fix it. And let them stay. Make them, make them citizens. If, if they're not doing anything wrong and they're working, make them citizens. And, but I do agree with Gary. Congress could have fixed our immigration problem 40 years ago, it, but they don't want to because it is great political fodder, and that's why they don't do it. Couldn't agree more. Still to come, after weeks of mental health care, Judge Lena Hidalgo announces she's once again ready to lead Harris County. Welcome back. It came almost on cue this past week. The Houston Chronicle published an op-ed penned by Alex Mueller, the runner-up in the 2022 election to lead Harris County as judge. Bottom line, Mueller called on the Democrat who narrowly beat her to either immediately return from extended out-of-state treatment for depression or step aside. Boom. An announcement from Judge Lena Hidalgo followed soon after informing us all that she's feeling much better and we'll be back at work on Tuesday, October 2nd. Panel, is there any point to be made here? I start with you, Charles Blaine. Well, yeah, I mean, we went, what, six, eight, eight uh, six weeks without hearing anything at all. I mean, she said she's going to be back early September, and here we are uh, mid-September and finally hearing something. And so, you know, right in the middle of budget and tax season, here she comes back. And I think it's also interesting because this year, and this is kind of a slight distraction, but this year, Harris County didn't even have public budget meetings. We did not get to hear, uh, the public did not get to hear from our budget directors or department directors on their budgets. And that's unlike they used to do, and that's something that people aren't really talking Talking about they only presented to staff I emailed the budget director to ask when the public budget meetings were and he said they're only going to be for staff this year commissioners court decided to to keep them to them and so these things we got to start paying attention to and being more outspoken about all right Bill is she coming back to raise taxes because if she doesn't come back they don't have a quorum if uh, Tom Ramsey walks well actually I talked to Commissioner Ramsey and he is going to show up for the vote because he got a big increase on the pay for law enforcement as part of this budget you know, last year when this all took place, they wouldn't even talk to him and, and, and Raddick, but this time they've talked to him, they've given a big increase for law enforcement, so Tom tells me he's going to vote and our law enforcement officer will get that big raise. So that's off the table. Look, <clears throat> county judge is the emergency manager, and what my concern is not having her in place to do that job. Now, we lucked out and didn't have a hurricane, but if we had her hurricane <clears throat> during this time, it would have been a serious problem. And look. I take depression very seriously. I've had family members that dealt with that. I hope she got the treatment she needs and I hope she can come back 
completely healthy. I still think that she violated the law on the vaccine contract. I still don't agree the way she's running the county, but I wish her the best on her mental health issues. Look, Gary Pollan will throw a fit if you don't <coughs> let him talk about this. Well, uh, uh, I did. I, I, I've represented scores of mentally ill people over the years, including depression, and the average stay for my clients who were depressed and put in the mental hospital involuntarily was like five, five to seven days. Okay, because what happens is you get your medication you need that works, you get stabilized, they send you for outpatient care. Poor Lena, she must have profound issues of depression because she's been gone for, what, eight weeks, ten weeks. She's finishing her hospital stay, and then she's going to go to outpatient services. So she's got real issues. I don't think she's been candid with the voters. I agree with Bill. We need a full-time county judge who's actually going to be active. The coincidence with Alexandra Mueller's op-ed piece was very interesting, and I think that precipitated the comments for our county judge that she's coming back. Joe, your thoughts? Leave Chris a little time. Absolutely. Look, uh, <coughs> uh, she's the county judge. She's also a human being, and those are not mutually exclusive. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'd also say mental health knows no calendar. Uh, it is uh, something that can be treated professionally. Thank God there are doctors and clinics that can help her. I look forward to her return. 20 seconds, Chris. Yeah, I thought it was horrible that Ms. Mueller did what she did and attacked somebody who's suffering from a mental illness. Um, uh, generally, when you're involuntarily put in, you're only in for a few days, but if you can pay for it, you can stay until you get healthy. Um, and you have a right to, uh, under the Americans Disabilities Act, take 12 weeks and get, and get healthy. I hope she's better, um, and I hope she uh, got the help she needs. I think we all do. Still ahead, Houston's top cop moves to cut the number of high-speed pursuits. But will the effort to reduce dangerous crashes allow too many criminals to evade capture? We'll now prohibit um, pursuits of suspects when the only possible uh, offense is a Class C. Also, a traffic or misdemeanor warrant or a non-violent misdemeanor warrant. Houston Police Chief Troy Fenner announcing his new pursuit policy designed to reduce the number of collisions, injuries, and deaths. At around 1,300 pursuits, uh, they're up 26% so far this year. During the same period, HPD reports four people have died and another have uh, 70, 172, 172 have been injured as a result of high-speed chases. Panel, the other side of this double-edged sword are all the folks who will simply escape after committing crimes. Okay, Gary, those are some of your clients. <laughs> yes, it is, and I said, and one of my lines is everybody runs, especially because we went through that era you know, uh, Black Lives Matter is where people were afraid of the police, and so they w didn't want to <laughs> hang around. I've had lots of clients. Basically, the typical scenario is the police are following you. They find out the car. They get hit, the car stolen, and they turn on their lights, and your client drives away. And sometimes it's a high-speed chase. The cars end up in a ditch. I had one case. I was telling Chris, my client uh, was driving away from the police and hit a curb, and the person who was in the seat next to him without a seatbelt got ejected, hit their head on the cement, and died. My client gets charged with felony murder. So it's very serious. The problem is, I heard about all everything Finner wants to do, but how do you differentiate when you're going to chase or not chase? He said, well, no felony warrants. Those aren't what stops people. It's, the, it's these active in the, the crime. So I don't think it's going to make a big difference. Joe Jaworski, you've been a mayor. Do you support this type of action? If it's data-driven, absolutely. And I believe the chief must have, you know, these numbers down cold. And so the city council and the mayor have a chance to review it. And if they say it's done, then that's the way the policy ought to be passed. You know, I mean, I watched the French Connection the other day, and, you know, that was a dangerous car chase. <laughs> that happens in Houston, too. And so if you're going to do something like that, it better be worth it. All right, this is one way to get the criminal caseload down. Just don't catch them, huh, Chris? Well, <laughs> you know, I know Troy Finner very, very well, and uh, he would not do this if he didn't have the right stats behind him. Uh, we've changed the chase policy in Houston multiple times over the last 25, 30 years, and it changes as we have these problems come up. Um, it, it really doesn't modify a lot, but what Troy Finner's doing here and just modifying for Class C misdemeanors in very low-end uh, cases, I don't. I, I think that's a good policy, and we're only going to chase people for really, really high-end cases and 
in cases where we think that we've got to get this guy because of what he's accused of. Okay, Charles, bring this home in a personal way for us. Yeah, so um, our, our co-panelist, Tamara Bell, this is something she's talked about numerous times, is about she was not in a car chase, but she was just driving somewhere, and there was a, a cop chasing a suspect, and, and they T-boned her, and she was in a coma for, for weeks over this. Thing. So it's a, it's a serious issue. You read the numbers off before. I think from, they said, 2018 to 22, there were like 740 um, incidents where people were harmed, and I think 27 deaths. So you really do have to consider risk reduction because these people are not involved in this, either innocent bystanders and if you need to let someone go for a class C misdemeanor in order to not kill someone then I think the trade-off is worth it. Ooh, I was gonna let Bill finish this segment but we gotta go to break. Sorry. Bill. All right. <laughs> when we come back more from those who waged a losing battle to hold Ken Paxton accountable. Tonight at 9:45 on this week's edition of Texas the Issue is with the Fox Texas Trio much more on the historic impeachment trial and ultimate acquittal of Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. This trial painted an accurate and clear picture of an out of control Attorney General who refused to listen to the desperate warnings of his conservative lawyers that he had entrusted to help run his office. Okay, gang, uh, winners and losers here. I'll start with you, Charles Blaine. Uh, I mean, well, winners, I think Paxton. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, I, I don't want to call them losers, but I think, you know, the House is going to have to do some some kind of inward looking and kind of figure out what's going on. And I think the Speaker should be looking to the future and seeing what happens there, because who knows? I, if I were led down the, the path to impeachment and now kind of put out on the plank, I'd be a little nervous. Okay, Gary Pollan, winners, losers? Uh, I think the losers is the standards we've established for our elected, key elected officials, and I think they've been lowered significantly, and I think it's unfortunate. Uh, winners, obviously, Paxton uh, and his legal team, who, who did what they had to do to win this. Uh, and we'll see what happens going forward. I, I said there's more shoes to drop in mm. Paxton's life, unfortunately, for him. Bill King, winners, losers? Long term, it's going to be the Texas Republican Party because this is going to set off a civil war. Now, the thing they have going for them is that the Democratic Party is just completely worthless. And so even if Paxton runs again, instead of nominating somebody like my friend here, they'll nominate a communist that <laughs> wants to take away all your guns <laughs> for attorney general, you know. Okay, Joe, 20 seconds. Well, you know, obviously the rule of law lost. Uh, they made the case, but it didn't matter because the jury was being intimidated by gobs of money uh, coming from Midland and Frisco. I think the long view is there's a chance if the Democrats want to be players that they can do some, something with this. 20 seconds, Chris. Final so word. I think the biggest loser in this whole thing was the lieutenant governor at the end of the day with that speech he gave and showed that his, uh, his mm. true stripes it was to... Uh, secure a victory for Ken Paxton. All right, we're going to leave it right there. Thanks to this week's panel, and thank you for joining us. The conversation continues next on national level with Fox News Sunday with Shannon Bream, and we'll keep talking here with What's Your Point Overtime, streaming live on fox26houston.com and on our Facebook page. From all of us here, have a safe and healthy week.